from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube. Now, here's your host, Dave Vellante. Hi everybody, this is Dave Vellante and welcome to this special CUBE conversation on a very important topic, cybersecurity and cyber resiliency. With me today is Stefan Voss, who's the Senior Director of Product Management for Data Protection Software and Cybersecurity and Compliance at Dell EMC. Stefan, thanks for coming on and helping us understand this, this very important topic ahead of uh, uh, RSA world. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Dave, for having me. You're welcome. So let's talk about the environment today. Uh, we have for years seen you know, back up, we're seeing backup evolve into data protection. Obviously disaster recovery is there, certainly long-term retention, but increasingly cyber resilience is part of the conversation. What are you seeing from customers? Yeah, definitely, we're seeing that evolution as well. It's definitely a changing market and what a perfect fit, right? We have to worry about right of breach, right? What happens when I get attacked? How can I recover? and the technologies we have, right, that we have for business resiliency, backup, they all apply. They all apply more than ever, but sometimes they have to be architected in a different way. So folks are very sensitive to, to that and they realize that you know, they have great technologies. To I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned the focus on recovery because we have a, a lot of conversations in theCUBE about the CIO and how he or she should be communicating to the board, or the CISO, how they should be communicating to the board. That conversation has changed quite dramatically over the last 10 years. Cyber is a board level issue. When you talk to certainly large companies, every quarter they're talking about cyber. And not just in terms of what they're doing to keep the bad guys out, but really what the processes are to respond, what the right regime is. You know, cybersecurity is obviously a team sport. It's not just the responsibility of the CISO, or the SecOps team, or the IT team. Everybody has to be involved and, and be aware of it. Are you seeing that awareness at board levels within your customer base and maybe even at smaller companies? 100%, I think the company size almost doesn't matter. Everybody can lose their business fairly quickly. And if there's one thing that NotPetya, that very bad uh, sort of uh, mm. attack told us is that it can be very devastating. And so if we don't have a process and if we don't treat it as a team sport, we'll be uncoordinated. So first of all, we learned that uh, recovery is real and we need to have a recovery strategy. It doesn't mean we don't do detection, so the NIST continu continuum applies. But the CISOs are much more interested in the actual data recovery than they ever were before, which is very interesting. Uh, and then you, know, you learn that the process is as important as the, as the technology. So in other words, uh, you know, Bob Bender, fabulous quote from Founders Federal, you know, the notion of sweating before the game. Uh, being prepared, having a notion of a, uh, a cyber recovery runbook, right? Because the nature of the disasters are changing, so therefore we have to think about using the same technologies in a different way. And I said at, at the open that things are shifting from just a pure backup and, and recovery spectrum to a much broader. Uh, the ROI is changing. People are trying to get more out of their data protection infrastructure than, than just insurance, and certainly risk management and, and cyber resiliency and response uh, is part of that. How is the ROI equation changing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very valid question. Uh, you know, we, we do have, um, people are asking for the ROI. We're we have to take a risk-based approach, right? We are mitigating risk. Um, it's never fun, right, to have any da data protection or, or you know, but business resilience topology because it's incremental cost, right? But we do that for a reason. We need to be able to have an operational recovery strategy a recovery strategy from a geographic uh, disaster, and of course now more so than ever, a recovery strategy from a you know from a from a cyber attack, right? And so therefore we have to think about uh, you know not so much the ROI, but what is my risk reduction, right? By having sort of that process in place, but also the the confidence that I can get to the data that I need to recover. And we're going to get into that a little bit later when we talk about the business impact analysis, but I want to talk about data isolation. Obviously ransomware is a hot topic today and this notion of, of, of creating an air gap. What 
is data isolation from your perspective? What are customers doing there? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot, I think almost every customer has a variant of data isolation. It's clear that it works. We've seen this from the NotPetya attack again, that where we were, large logistics company, right? Found data of the domain controller on a system that underwent went maintenance in Nigeria, so a system that was offline. But we don't want to operate that way. So we want to get the principles of isolation because we know it kind of uh, reduces the attack surface, right, from the internal actor, from ransomware variants, you name it, right, all these are, you know, when you have stuff on the network, it's theoretically fair game for the attacker. So that Nigeria example was basically by luck, there was a system Correct. offline, Correct. under maintenance, that yes. happened to be isolated, yep. and so they were able to recover from, from that system. Absolutely, and another example was, of course, critical data, that domain controller, because that's what this attack happened to go after, was on tape. And so, you know, this just shows and proves that isolation works. The challenge we were running into with every customer we work with was the recovery time, especially when you have to do selective recovery more often. You know, we want to be able to get the benefits of online media, but also get sort of the benefits of isolation. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to recover from tape. Tape is there as a last resort, and hopefully right. you never have to go to it. How are customers sort of adopting this, this data isolation strategy and, and policy? Who's involved? What are some of the prerequisites that they need to think about? Yeah, so the good thing, first things first, right, we have technology we know and love, so our data protection appliances, where we started architecting this workflow uh, that we can uh, use. So in other words, you don't have to learn a new technology, buy something else, there's an incremental investment, yes. Uh, and then we have to think about who's involved. So that earlier point, the security folks are almost always involved and they should be involved. Sometimes they fund the project, sometimes it comes out of IT, right? So this is the collaborative effort and then uh, to the extent it's necessary, of course you want to have GRC, so the risk people involved, to make sure that uh, we really focus on uh, the most important critical assets, right? Now ahead of RSA, let's talk a little bit about um, what's going on in that world. Um, there are security frameworks, NIST in particular, is one that's relatively new. I mean, it's kind of 2014 it came out, it's been mm -hmm. revised, really t focusing on kind of prevent, detect, and very importantly, respond, something yeah. we've talked about a lot. Uh, are people using that framework? Are they doing the kind of self-assessments that NIST uh, prescribes, what's your take? Yeah, I think they are, right? So, so first of all, they are realizing that leaning too much left of breach, in other words, hoping that we can always uh, catch everything, sort of the eggshell perimeter, everybody understands that that's not enough, so we have to go in depth and we also have to have a recovery strategy. Mm -hmm. And so the way I always like to break it down pragmatically is one, what do I prioritize on, right? So we can always spend money on everything, but doing a business impact analysis and then maybe governing that in a tool like uh, RSA Archer can help me be a little bit more strategic. And then on the other end, if I can do a better job coordinating the data recovery along with the incident response, that'll go a long way. Uh, you know, and of course that doesn't forego any investment sort of in the detection, but it is widely adopted. One of the key parts about the NIST framework is, is understanding exposure in the supply chain where you may not have total control over one of your suppliers, you know, policies, but yet they're embedded into your, your workflow. How are people handling that? Is there a high degree of, of awareness there? What, what, what are you seeing? It is, absolutely. That's why product security is such an important element, and it's the number one priority for, for Dell security, even above and beyond the internal sort of security of our data center, as crazy as it sounds, because you know we can do a lot of damage right in the market. So certainly supply chain, making sure we have robust products all along the way is, is something that every customer asks asks about all the time, and it's uh, very important. Let's come back to business impact analysis. Yeah. We've mentioned it a couple of times now. What, what is a business impact analysis, and, and how do you guys go about helping your customers conduct one? Yeah, I mean, let, let's maybe keep it to that example. Let's say I go through this analysis, and I find that I'm a little bit fuzzy on the recovery, and that's an area I want to invest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then I buy off on the concept that I have an isolated or a cyber recovery vault, so an isolated enclave, onto which I can then copy data and make sure that I can get to it when I have to recover. Um, the question then becomes, well, what is business critical mean, 
Uh, and then that's where the business impact analysis will help to say, what is your business critical process? Number one, number two, what are the associated applications, assets? Because so when you have that dependency map, it makes it a lot easier to start prioritizing what uh, applications do I put in the vault, in the other words, right, in this, in this specific example? And then how can I put it into financial terms uh, to justify the investment? Well, we were talking about ROI before. I mean, really, we've done actually quite a few studies uh, looking at Global 2000 and the cost of downtime. I mean, these are, these are real tangible uh, 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 metrics that if you can reduce the amount of downtime or you can reduce the security threat, you're talking about putting money back in, in your pocket because Global 2000 organizations are losing millions and millions of dollars every year. So it is actually hard ROI, even though some people might look at it as, as softer. I want to talk about isolated uh, uh, data vault, you know, this mm -hmm. notion of air gaps. What are you guys specifically doing there? Do you have solutions in that area? Yeah, we do. So we are using, luckily, sort of the concepts that we know from business resiliency, disaster recovery, right? So our data protection um, storage, which is very robust, it's very secure, it has very secure replication. So we have the mechanisms to get data into the vault. We have the mechanisms to create a read-only read copy, so an immutable copy that I can then go back into. So all of this is there, right? But the problem is, how do I do? How do I automate that workflow? So that's a software that we wrote uh, that goes along with the data protection appliance sale. Uh, and what it does, it's all about ingesting that business critical data that I talked about into the secure enclave, and then rendering it into an immutable copy that I can get to when I have nowhere else to go. Okay, so you've got that gap, yep. that air gap. Now, the bad guys will, will say, hey, I can get through an air gap, I can dress somebody up as a worker <laughs> and st put a stick in. And, and so, how much awareness is there uh, of that exposure? And, and I know it's maybe, you know, we're hitting the tip of the pyramid here, but it's still important. Absolutely. Can you guys help address that through whether it's processes or, or product or experience? 100%, so we have of course our consulting services that will then work with you on elements of physical security. Or how do I lock down that remaining replication link, right? It's just about raising the bar mm -hmm. for the attacker to make it more likely we'll catch them before they can get to really the prized assets. We're just raising the bar, but yes, those are things we do. So consulting, physical security. How do I do secure reporting out? How do I secure management going in? How do I secure that replication or synchronization link into the vault? All of these are topics that we then discuss if they kind of deviate from the best practices and we have very good answers through our many customer engagements. Stefan, let's talk about some of the specific offerings. RSA is a portfolio company in the Dell Technologies Group. It's a sister company of Dell EMC. What are you guys doing with RSA? Are you integrating with any of their you know, specific products? Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think, um, so when you think about recovery and incident response being so important, there's an obvious, right? So. What RSA has found, I thought this was very interesting, is that the, there's a lack of coordination between typically the security teams and the, uh, the, the data professionals, data mm. re restoration professionals. Um, so the more we can bridge that gap through technology, reporting, the better it is, right? So uh, there's, a, there's a logical affinity between an incident response retainer, activity, and the data recovery solutions that we provide. That's one example. Right, so because every day counts. That example that I talked about, not Petya, the specific customer was losing 25 euros every day. If I can shave off one day, it's money in the bank, mm -hmm. or money not out of the bank. The other area is, how do I make sure that I'm strategic about uh, what data I protect in this way? That's the BIA Archer. And then there's some integrations we, we are looking at from an analytics perspective. Ar Archer being the sort of governance, risk, and yeah. compliance, workflow, that's right. a, a sort of a, one of the flagship products of, of RSA. So you integrate yeah. to that framework. Um, and, and what about analytics? Um, things like I, IOC, uh, 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 RSA NetWitness, yeah. is, is, are those products that you're sort of integrating to or with or leveraging in any way? Yeah, first off, analytics in general, it's an interesting concept. Now we have data inside our secure enclave, right? So what if we could actually go in and give more confidence to the actual copies that we're storing there? So we're, we, are, we have an ecosystem from an analytics perspective. We work with one specific company. We have a REST API based integration where we then essentially use them to, to do a vote of confidence on the copy of the raw backup, 
Is it good? Are there signs that it was corrupted by malware and so forth? So what that helps us do is be more proactive around our recovery because I knew, I think you're about to say something, but you know, if oh, I knew there's something um, you know, suspicious, then I can start my analytics activity that much sooner. Well, the light bulb went off in my head. Yeah. That's what I was, because if I have an air gap, um, and I was saying before, it, it's necessary but insufficient, if I can run analytics on the corpus of the backup data and identify anomalies, mm -hmm. I might be able to, to end run you know, somebody trying to get through that air gap that I just mentioned before, maybe it's a physical, you know, security breach, um, and, and the analytics might inform me. Is yes. that a reasonable scenario? It is a reasonable scenario, although we do something slightly different. So first of all, did, you know, detection mechanisms, left of breach stuff is what it is. We love it, we sell it, you know, we use it. But you know, when it comes to backup, they're, they're not off the shelf tools we can just use and say, hey, why don't you scan this backup? It doesn't mm -hmm. typically work. So what we do is in the vault, we have time. We have a workbench, so it's almost like sending a, a specimen to the lab. And then we take a look at it. Are there any signs that there was data corruption that's indicative of a ransomware attack? And when there is some such a scenario, we say, you might want to take a look at it and do some further investigation. That's when we then look at net witness or working with the security teams. But we can now be of service and say, you might want to look at this copy over here. It, it's, it's suspicious, there's an indicator of compromise, and then take the next steps, other than hoping for the best. You mentioned the ecosystem. The, yeah. You mentioned the ecosystem before, I want to double click on that. So, uh, talk about the ecosystem. Uh, we said here, it's, it's a team sport, you can't yeah. just do it alone. Um, from a platform perspective, it, it, is it open, is it API based? Maybe you could give some examples of how you're working with the ecosystem and how they're leveraging the platform. Yeah, 100%, so like I said, so we have you know, our data protection appliances and that's sort of our plumbing, right, to get the data to where I want. We have the orchestration software. This is the part we're talking about. The orchestration software has a REST API, everything's documented in Swagger, and the reason we did that is that we can do these orchestrations with third-party uh, analytics vendors. That's one use case, right? So I'm here, I have a copy here, please scan, tell me what you find, and then give me an alert if you find something. The other example would be maybe doing a level of resiliency orchestration where you t automate the recovery workflow beyond what we would have to offer. There are many examples, but that is how we are in enabling the ecosystem, essentially. You mentioned Founders Federal yes. earlier. Is that, a, is that a customer, is yes. it a reference customer? What can you tell me about them? Yeah, it's a reference customer, and they uh, very much saw the need uh, for sort of this type of protection. Um, and uh, you know, we've been working with them. There's a, there's a Dell World uh, last year session that we did with them. Uh, and, and very much the same sort of, like the quote said, focus on the process, not only the product and the set of technologies, right? And uh, so that's how we've been partnering with them. The, the quote being, sweat before the game? Sweat that came before from the game. Founders yes. Federal, that's a great quote. Um, all right, we've talked a lot about just sort of general uh, uh, terms about cyber recovery. What can you tell us, tell the audience, what makes Dell EMC cyber recovery different in the marketplace and you know, relative to your competition? How do you, pit, you know, pitch me? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very unique capability because one, you need a large install base and sort of a, a, a proven platform to even build it on, right? So when you look at the data domain technology, we have a lot to work with and we have a lot of customers using it. So that's very hard to mimic. We have the orchestration software where we, I believe, are ahead of the game, right? So the orchestration software that I talked about that gets the data into the vault securely and then our ecosystem, right? So those are really the three things. And then of course we have the consulting services, which is also hard to mimic, to really you know, design the process around this whole thing. But I think the ecosystem sort of approach is also very powerful. You have a big portfolio, you got yeah. a sister company that's sort of well known obviously in this business. Do you also have solutions? I mean, for instance, is there, is there an appliance as part of the portfolio that, that fits in here? And, and you know, what is that? Yes, yeah, so you can think of this as, if I wanted to really boil it down, the two things I would buy is a data domain, it could be the smallest one, and a VxRail appliance that runs the software, and then I stick that in the vault, and then there's sort of that product. So you can think of it as an appliance, um, that happens to go with the software that I talked about that does the orchestration. Okay, so RSA, the premier conference on, on cyber, coming up in a couple weeks. What do you guys got going there? Give us a little tease. 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to be an awesome show and uh, we will have a booth and so we look forward to a lot of customer conversations and we do have a panel. Um, it's going to be with MasterCard and RSA and myself and we're really going to take it from left of reach all the way to right of reach. Awesome. Uh, do you know when that panel is yet? or is it, uh, it is, I think, on the 5th. Okay. I have to check. But which is uh, which day? It's a uh, day. I want to say it's Wednesday. So, the, so it starts on the Monday, right? So yeah. there'll be yeah. day three. So check right. the Check the you know the conference schedule. Yes. I mean things change I mean, exactly. it's, it's in the last minute, but uh, but that's great. Um, you know, Mastercard is, a, is an awesome re reference customer. We, we've worked with them in in the past, and so uh, that's great. Stephen, thanks very much for for coming to the cube and sharing uh, some of your perspectives and what's coming up at uh, RSA. It's good thanks to have so you. Thanks so much, David. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody. This is Dave Vellante from our East Coast headquarters. You're watching the cube.